What is going on, ladies and gentlemen? My man Xavier Scruggs is in the building. What's up, man? Hey, what's going on, man? I appreciate you uh, getting me on here. This is this is fun, man. I'm I'm glad we got got this going, man. Back to back, back to back. The newest segment here on Miami Sports Music's number one Miami Fan Morning Show. Clock blockers. My man Xavier Scruggs is in the building. Before we get started on anything, it's been a while since you've been on the program. How you been, man? What's going on? Oh man, I've been good. I can't complain. Just trying to keep up with these uh, these three kids over here. The two boys. I got a three year old and a two year old. They keep me busy running around. Um, you know, but it's good. It's good. I'm I'm enjoying it. I can't hope for anything better than them to be wanting to run around. You know, and be energetic because that's what I love and that's what I did when I was young. So I love it. Man, they keep you busy, man. I have two, so I get it, man. And I can, right. you know, what happens when you have three, though, right? The inmates outnumber the guards. Man, so that's you, you're not lying, man. <laughs> you're not lying. It's crazy. All right, what you know? What else is crazy? Baseball over the last few weeks, taking over the sports world. Heck, in the last 24, 48 hours, um, there's good things and there's bad things to it. But I think anytime the sports world is talking baseball, is always a good thing even if it's controversial. So before we get into lockout talk, let's talk about the hot topic right now, and that is Major League Baseball Hall of Fame voting that came out yesterday. Um, let's give props where props are due. David Ortiz gets elected. Tell me what you think about David Ortiz getting elected to the Hall of Fame. Yeah, I think it's well-deserved. I mean, you look at what he did throughout the course of his career, um, you know, not just during the regular season, but such a postseason season impactful player i think that says a lot about the type of player that he was for boston um and, and you got to think about it too like the, his career started out a little mediocre in minnesota but then being able to make that transition and being an impactful player but then also being an ambassador for the game um the numbers speak for themselves but he's such a bigger personality um that really deserves to be in the hall of fame i, I look at uh, you know, obviously there's a lot of guys that were on the ballot that had an opportunity as far as numbers go. Um, but yeah, I think he deserved it. I think, um, you know, you're going to get some, some guys that feel a certain way, some voters that feel a certain way, some, some supporters of the game that feel a certain way with his name being associated with, um, uh, s some testing that went on during 2003 that was, yep. um, you know, that really wasn't <laughs> supposed to go out to the public. So, um, everybody's going to have their opinion, but I'm I'm happy for David Ortiz and, and well-deserved. 307 votes with 77% of the vote. Um, believe it or not, you know, the next person on the list was Barry Bonds. He got 260, vo uh, 260 votes for 66%. His final year on the ballot, Roger Clemens, 257 votes with 65% five years on the ballot, uh, final year on the ballot. And Kurt Schilling, with 231 votes, 58% of the vote, and his final year on the ballot. Bonds, Clemens, and Schilling. It is so interesting to see that our all-time home runs leader, our all-time, uh, I think, wins, or it, I don't, I know Roger Clemens is up there, but to not see these guys in the Hall of Fame, I think, is a travesty in itself. I don't know where you stand on this as a former player, because if you look at it, this is what this is what I say. Let me kind of state where I'm at. From the 1980s to the early 2000s, there's no way to go back and say which players did or did not use performance enhancing drugs or steroids, right? And so with that being said, I personally believe as an outsider looking in that it was part of the game. In 1994, baseball had a major league baseball strike. It was in its worst uh it, it didn't look good. Things did not look good for major right, league baseball. Right, yeah. 4 years later, they're interrupting live news broadcasts to show you at bats of Mark McGuire and Sammy Sosa, who, in my opinion, single handedly that summer saved baseball. Yeah, so I, I don't understand <laughs> the hypocrisy from the writers not voting these guys in, no matter if they were great guys, uh, you know, off the field or not. Yeah. So, what no, are your thoughts about all this? It, it, it's disappointing, um, honestly, to me. And yes, I'm I'm weary of the association with PEDs. Um, I understand that everybody has different opinions, um, but I'm I'm on the I'm on the the side of understanding that the Hall of Fame should represent every every era within the game's best. Yep. And I look at those guys as being representatives of the best players during that time. Um, it, and I also understand that 
you know, as, as much as steroids might have been uh, illegal at the time, that was also something that hadn't been implemented as far as rules go within the, the, the Major League Baseball. You know, there was no testing specifically in place during that time. So I feel like if that's the case, anybody could have been popped for any sort of over-the-counter, could have been a, a performance hazard drug. We don't know what it could have been. Um, I think since there's no definite line there until 2004, I feel like those guys should not be uh, penalized. Uh, and, and that's just my opinion on it. Um, it, it I, I feel like you have to represent our game. And, and and like you said, like the home runs leader, the ERA lead, like those types of things need to be represented within the game. And um, it's unfortunate that they, they won't be during this time, but hopefully they have an opportunity with the uh, – uh, the, the the today's committee uh, voting committee to be able to vote them in. Clap blockers home of the number one Miami fan morning show with its brand new baseball segment back to back with my man Xavier Scruggs. Um, Xavier, let me kind of come at it from a different way. So now the baseball writers have ten years to vote these guys in, and that's how they originally get in. Does there need to be a new process and how we vote players into the Hall of Fame? Because there's the mindset from the younger generation that these guys have no clue. They're not involved in the day-to-day -day process on how we do things anymore. We live in a world now where are the writers really the ones that understand the game the best, that they should be voting who gets into the Hall of Fame? Because we live in a digital era now. We live in a digital world. So what does that say to the average young fan who says, why are the writers the ones that are making the choices here and not former players? Um, people who currently cover the game from a media standpoint, um, like digital wise, like why are the writers still the people? And I don't know if you have the answer for that, but I just like to get your take on that. Yeah, no, I think that there's, there's definitely ways that you can implement, you know, other people to be associated with the voting, to have those opportunities. Um, it started with the baseball writers, right? So it's, it's kind of their thing. Um, and it, it's something that they've done pretty well for a long period of time until you kind of get to this period in which there's so much gray area. Um, but ultimately, that's voting, right? That's voting for whatever you're you're trying to vote for, whether that be something with politics, whether that be voting uh, over a team that you that you like over a different team, whatever it may be. Um, everybody's going to have different opinions. Everybody comes from different backgrounds, different environments. Um, when you talk about the character clause, like everybody's going to have different feelings on that. Um, but ultimately that's voting. And, and no matter how you change the system, there's always going to be something wrong with it. Um, you know, that some, somebody is always going to have something wrong with it. Um, but I, you, we have to remember that they've done this thing right for a long period of time. They've created some ways to where some guys that haven't been able to get in. I'm, I'm supposed to talk to Lee Smith today, the, the one of the best relievers in all of baseball during it, ever, right? And mm -hmm. um, and I talked, and I'll talk to him today. And he was a guy that that for 15 straight years, for a while, it was 15 years that you were able to stay on the ballot. He got passed up, and then was able to be vote, voted in by the um, today's committee. So you look at. You know, it's it's never it's never going to be 100 percent right. And I, I mean, there's always going to be some things that we can say we can do to it. But ultimately, there's always going to be something um, wrong with the system. Is there an asterisk by getting voted in on today's committee compared to the brighters? Like, do you think that p people look at that differently? I, I don't think so. Um, I, I look at it as. Uh, you know, an opportunity for kind of what you mentioned, like some people that may be more focused on today's era of the game that understand more of today's analytics, maybe understand today's data a little bit more. Um, and, and they get to dive in on some guys' numbers that may have been overlooked at a time. So I don't I don't feel like that that's necessarily the case. Um, and, and also we're evaluating players differently nowadays. So I mentioned Lee Smith as a reliever, like a lot of people don't know how to evaluate a reliever when it comes to the hall of fame, the same thing, uh, now for a DH, right? There was a lot of talk about what, which DHs deserve to be in the hall of fame. They don't play a defensive position. So, um, the way we evaluate the game and players is different nowadays It is different and evolves. All right, let's let's kind of transition out of the MLB voting because I think it's a very controversial topic to begin with. But baseball has its own current problems in itself as they are in the middle of a lockout. And I know this isn't necessarily the thing we want to speak 
uh, on January 26th when pitchers and catchers are going to be reporting or supposed to be reporting here in what, 14 days, yeah. some in a few days. Um, I know uh, the MLBPA and the MLB have been meeting uh, for the last couple of days, a couple of times. We've gotten a little bit of progress, but nothing major and nothing looks to be on the horizon. From my opinion, what have you heard and what have, what are the things that are like keeping these two sides apart right now? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, I, I, there has been progress, right? Uh, now that they're actually meeting, they've met consecutive days in a row. That's always something positive. Um, th there's been momentum moving towards the players coming off of some of the requests that they've had um, when it comes to revenue sharing, uh, when it comes to free agency. Um, they've come off of those, which were which were some bigger things that they seem to be looking for. Now we're getting a better idea of the, the Players Association priorities. And I think that was one of the biggest questions from the owners from the beginning was, what is it that's the biggest priority for you? Because you're throwing out a lot of things which is understandable because they feel like they lost in the last CBA. So they're trying to gain everything back in one sense, but in one swoop, but you can't do that within this, within the game. You can't make major changes all of a sudden within the way the game is, is, is handled. Um, and so now you look at there being some momentum, you look at the, some of the bigger issues. Now, how are we going to pay some of the younger players? The owners understand that the younger players now um, dominate the game, right? There's a lot of value in, in how we place younger players um, a, as a product on the field. So minimum salary needs to go up. Um, there needs to be something done for arbitration as far as when it takes some, some players to get to arbitration. Um, and ultimately, the biggest thing for the players is the competitiveness on the field. They don't want to see some of these teams – feel like they have to tank or feel like they have to lose for four, three or four years before they can finally put a productive team on the field. So uh, I think we're starting to make the make those decisions in the right directions as far as the, the CBA agreement goes. Um, but but who's to say how long that that's going to take? Raise the minimum salary to six hundred and fifteen thousand dollars for players with a zero to one year service time. The league previously offered six hundred thousand. The minimum salary was 570 in 2021, and the Major League Baseball Players Association is seeking 775,000. Major League Baseball did not change its proposal set for $650,000 uh, for players with one year, one to two year service time. Let's talk about service time because I think service time is something that I think is a big thing. Um, I live in Baltimore, so seeing somebody like Cedric Mullins not get on a roster for those first couple of years because the Orioles were they didn't want to start his service clock time, but that man deserved to be on an opening day roster, what, three years ago, right? And same idea, you know, for, you know, the Miami Marlins. They have had players that deserve to be on an opening day roster, but because if they just wait out two months, their service clock's not going to start. Right. Explain to people, to the average fan, how that kind of works and where the two sides are disagreeing on that. Yeah, I think the the biggest thing is from a player's perspective, you look at what you just said, right? Some of the, the best product in an organization is being held back because they don't want to start their service clock. And that service clock, once that started, that's, you know, days counted up until they can, until players can really start getting paid. So teams don't want to start that clock necessarily, especially if they're a team that doesn't see themselves winning in the near future. So you mentioned the Orioles. Um, you, you think back and, and when Chris Bryant was uh, originally a, a minor leaguer that was available to be on the big league roster and they held him back um, as far as that was service the Cubs. time manipulation. Yeah, that was the Cubs. Yeah, the, with exactly. the Cubs, yeah. So the, there's a lot did, of – Orioles did the same thing with Machado too. Machado yeah, was, yeah. Yes, you Machado, know. Yeah, so it happens to a lot of the better players that – you know, maybe haven't maybe their time clock they don't want to start yet because they understand this player is going to get to free agency pretty quick, and that's the less time that we can have with this player, as well as arbitration. Once they hit arbitration, that's more money they can start to make more money out of the team's pocket, the owner's pocket. So the the manipulation within that is what the players are disappointed about, not just because not wanting to pay the players, but also you're still not getting the best product on the field for some of these teams. And that's what we talk about when we're talking about competitiveness. You want fans want the best product on the field. Players want the best product on the field and the owners should want that for their teams. Um, so that's the disappointment from the player standpoint, from the owner standpoint. 
It's, hey, th these are our players. We decide who who we want to have play mm -hmm. at, at a certain time. We're the ones that have the clock for them, right? If, if we decide that they're not ready, they're not ready. But I think they also understand that the younger player is becoming more valued now. So there has to be some sort of change when it comes to how you're able to compensate this young, the younger players that are impacting the game at a high level. You know, one of the things that I don't believe is being discussed enough in this uh, Players Association uh, and the contract uh, negotiation between the MLBPA and MLB is how players are marketed. You know, one of the things that I absolutely love about you and how you're going about promoting the game of baseball is social media, being able to have a face that, you know, I can put, you know, if I if I literally right now went to my son and said, here's a picture of five people. And in the five, there's Mike Trout, there's two attack of Iloa, there's, you know, Dan Marino, there's mm -hmm. it, my son would have no idea who Mike Trout is, mm. would have no idea who Mike Trout yeah. is, who's the best, arguably the best player in the game. How do we move forward for fan? I love baseball, but I'm scared for baseball. I'm petrified for baseball right now because I want to see them make the right decisions when it comes to marketing and promoting the game. Having games on YouTube is great, but look at what ESPN just did with the Manning cast, you know, for, and, mm -hmm. and, and, and where, and where sports are being marketed now and where Amazon is trying to get the NFL's, you know, ticket package and, and people like Al Michaels and, you know, Joe Buck I mean, they're they're starting to become obsolete when I would rather listen to Xavier Strutz for two and a half hours on a broadcast. <laughs> Just me personally. OK, so like what are your thoughts about the marketing of the game moving forward? And why isn't that being discussed more in the labor disputes? Because I really think players have I think players want to be able to market themselves more. Yeah, I, I do. Um, I agree with you. It needs, it needs to be something done. Um, but I think it's something ultimately from both sides, right? And and I think that's a, a, a perfectly way to put it. You know, it should be something being discussed because there's a lot of money within that. Mm -hmm. um, uh, when it comes down to it, I, I, I look at MLB as just almost being a step behind some of these other sports when it comes to, um, you know, being able to really utilize these platforms, these social platforms, these other opportunities that we see arising um, you know, and, and I want to say maybe because it's been such a, a, a pastime within our, within our history is as baseball kind of being one way and, and being one of those sports that, Hey, maybe we don't need to highlight specific players necessarily all the time. Um, but I think that's a way of the past, right? Like we understand how important storytelling is. I think it's gotta be something that's done on, on all levels, on all platforms. And I think it needs to be initiatives from the players as well to be able to kind of create their own wave. If the if MLB is not going to be able to do what you expect them to do or what you want them to do, you have to keep searching out ways and but, discovering ways to do that w within your own uh, as well. But players are scared to get blackballed. And, and I hate to bring his name up because of all the off-the-field issues that are going on with him, but Trevor Bauer is a prime example. Trevor Bauer created his own, you know, uh, niche uh, within the, the YouTube community started doing his own thing and major league baseball from the outside looking in wanted nothing to do with that. Now yeah, I, think, I know he's a very controversial figure, but I think he's a prime example of what we're talking about here. I, I think major league baseball wouldn't have a problem with that. If, if it was, if it was somebody that, you know, was more focused on positivity, promoting the game and, and in a sense, not having, to feel like they have to down talk MLB, down talk the owners, um, down talk the social aspects of MLB, um, because I think you can do all those things without being like detrimental towards, you know, like negativity towards those things. And I think that's kind of the bigger issue with MLB is, hey, like we want like if, if you talk to MLB social, if you talk to MLB marketing. Um, all that in which I do uh, constant communication. They want all of those things for players to do that stuff. They just don't, they want it done in a positive manner, right? They don't want you talking badly about the league and, and, and the same goes for every other sport, right? You wouldn't want something like that. So I think that's something that's definitely being more encouraged, but I think at the same time, baseball has had such a 
kind of older mentality about itself. But I think we're seeing like a new wave of players and a younger generation that aren't afraid to speak out, aren't afraid to do some certain things. And I think uh, we'll start to catch up here. You know, I, I really appreciate you saying that because I, I think that's something that's not being said enough that baseball wants to encourage this more, but they want to do it in a way that makes sense for them to improve the positive manner in which the game they want represented out to the public. And right. I think a part of that is, you know, allowing people like like uh, John Boy uh, John Boy Media, who I absolutely love, doing stuff right, allowing people like yourself to be able to do highlights. And you're, you know, th by the way, if you guys aren't following my man's TikTok, what are you doing with your life? Because your TikTok <laughs> is fire, bro. And and I really mean that because you're able to do. That. Let me do top five. You know, um, uh, people charging the mound is one that you just had, which I love. Um, if more people or Major League Baseball got behind that more, I'm telling you, I think it'd be huge to a younger generation who this is what they're doing. They're just flipping through the phone. So they want content quick and they want good content. And yeah. I would I would sit for two minutes and watch the, you know, the top five people you don't charge them out to. Right and, right. and I'm more than a casual fan, but I think the casual fan likes that stuff. Right. So right. I, I just I, I felt like it needs to be said from there. And I also if Major League Baseball is listening, I think another thing they just need to do is get more involved with allowing people that represent the game like yourself to do more stuff within the game. The YouTube channels, um, doing games on YouTube, doing game on Twitch. I know you've done stuff with both of those things, and I just think it's it, it's a big thing in helping the game move forward. And I think you agree with me. Yeah, no, definitely. Um, you know, all the opportunities that – that I seek are, are going in those types of lanes, right? How to present the game um, in a positive manner on platforms that we don't necessarily always get to use. Right. And, mm -hmm. I, and I think that's something that's eye opening for major league baseball itself. I think they have to look around and see, okay, what are some of these other sports doing that we're not doing? And I think what you mentioned is one of the biggest things is look at some of these other creators within these lanes, look at some of these other people using these platforms and, and promote them because that's going to be one of the best ways that you can continue to get eyes on the sport. 100%. All right, so I'm going to ask you some questions. I don't know if you can give me the answers to you. Have you found out, like, what the deal is for opening day? Are you covering a game? Do you know where you're at? I want to know these things because that tells me, hey, ESPN is, like, moving forward with, you know, how they're, they think opening <laughs> day is going to happen. So yeah, yeah. What's the deal with you? Yeah, no, uh, a lot of stuff is up in the air right now, and I'm, I wish <laughs> I could. That's not what I wanted to hear, I Xavier. Know, I know. Hopefully, I can have a better update for you next time I, I jump on here. But um, a lot of stuff up in the air, but all good things, right? There's there's opportunities with ESPN, um, MLB Network. Um, you know, I live here in Tampa. Opportunities with the Rays. I, I work with the Cardinals, so. I think a lot of it is going to be dependent upon kind of what happens with this lockout, uh, to be honest with you. So mm -hmm. I'm I'm kind of just hoping to hear a, as much as you are right now. <laughs> I, I'm really the same boat because all I really want to hear is, hey, the two sides have come to an agreement. Let me let me ask you. Let me just get back on the subject real quick, because there was an article that came out from an independent third party source, which I don't normally like to talk about those things, but they're like. Major League Baseball is okay with delaying the start of opening day. That's absurd, right? Like reading something like that. They don't want to delay that, do they? No, they, they don't want that. Um, I think you have to remember that every side, um, whether it be the owners or the players, they want to try to use something within a conversation, within a, a document, something um, you know that they can put out to the public and, and be able to use as a sense of, hey, we're willing to get started, but maybe these guys aren't willing to get started. So um, the, there was words that that might have been taken out of context, at least the owners, the people, the two guys that were in the room. I cannot remember the names. I know I know one of them um, was the, the Rockies owner, but um, were, they mentioned words have been taken out of context. And I'm sure that's both sides. Neither side really wants that. Right. I, I, I hope that you're right. And I hope that in a couple of weeks we're talking about pitchers and catchers reporting yeah. and we're talking about the moves the Miami Marlins are going to make to compete in the NL East because uh let me tell you man the Mets the Phillies the Braves the defending like 
Tell me that's not the toughest division in baseball right now. It's going to be a strong division, man. It's it's going to be extremely strong. I still think the NL East is, or I'm sorry, the AL East is going to be strong as well. But the the NL minus East the is, Orioles, minus the Orioles. Yeah, minus the Orioles. But you got you know you got some tough tough teams there in that NL East. Um, all will be battling, beating up on each other. I don't think one necessarily separates themselves from the pack. So I think. Um, I think every team there, maybe besides the Nationals, really has an opportunity to come out of that division. You know, real quick, I saw one of your videos talking about the uh, wall changes to Camden Yards and how you think that's a bad thing for the game. Uh, just give me a brief rundown on why you think that's a bad thing for the game. I just like more homers, man. I just like, you know, whether it be for the Orioles or whether it be for a team coming in to play the Orioles, um, I want to see more homers being hit. And, and I, I understand that, you know, every team is different. Every stadium is different. But I, I also like the idea of if a, if a stadium has been a certain way and it's been, you know, it, it, that's kind of like marks that stadium, right? It doesn't necessarily always have to change. I think that's what's kind of cool about Wrigley. That's what's cool about Boston. Um, you know, I, it gives it that old school feel. So I, I just like the homer aspect, man. If guys want to pull it to, to left, right-handers pull it to left, or if guys want to go oppo, the lefties want to go oppo, man. Let them do so. I mean, I don't disagree with you, but as a GM, if I'm the GM and I'm trying to get pitchers to come here and the pitchers are telling me there's no way I'm coming to the Camden Yard so my ERA can go up. And I feel like that's ultimately what led to the decision is so that they could bring on more pitchers, free yeah. agent pitchers. No, there's probably, yeah, there's probably a lot of data and analytics behind the idea of, you know, you, it being more beneficial for them to do so for their own team, um, especially in that AL East, right, where there's so many right-handed dominant power hitters. Um, mm -hmm. it, it makes a lot of sense. So it, I just don't like it because I, I want to see the homers as a fan, right? Yeah, 100%. And real quick, my last uh, thing I just want to briefly talk to you about is my favorite manager in all of baseball is managing again with the New York Mets and Buck Showalter. Um what are your thoughts about Buck managing the Mets and how is that going to be uh, for the NL East and, and the Mets moving forward? I mean, I love that. I, I, I think one of the biggest thing with the Mets is like they need a clubhouse culture type of change right within the organization. It, I think he's the best person to come in. He's not going to have any games. You know, he's so defined with details. I talked to Adam Jones. I mean, like this, he has such high praise for a guy like Buck Showalter because when you see a manager like that, that has such an extreme eye for the details of the game, it makes level. It makes you level up as a player, um, and, and that's what that's what AJ mentioned to me. And I think those things um, really start to change an idea of what a culture looks like within an organization. Once you're able to have somebody at the head, at the at the lead, um, setting the right example. So that's what the Mets need ultimately. Xavier Mantel, number one, thank you for coming on. I'm super excited. Every two weeks, you're going to come on. We're going to have, I'm going to call it, I'm just going to call it right now, the best segment in all of baseball on any show anywhere. Back to back, Stephen D, Xavier Scruggs, tell people where they can find all your stuff because your social media needs to get more love. And I want everybody who's watching right now to listen very closely about Xavier's social media. Go ahead, man. Yeah, man. Xavier underscore Scruggs, Instagram, Twitter, uh, TikTok, uh, YouTube, Xavier Scruggs. So pretty simple. Um, go check me out. And uh, yeah, appreciate the love. Nah, man, I appreciate you coming on and being a part of the family here at Miami Sports Music, and I will see you in two weeks, and hopefully by that time, we're talking about pitchers and catchers reporting. Yes, sir. Sounds good, my man. Appreciate you having me. No problem, man. Have a good one, Xavier. Later.